day two of the Warwick Economic Summit. I have the pleasure to be here with uh, Professor Maury Bobsfield, um, who is currently uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, who is also the former chief economist uh, at the IMF. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I'd like to start with what is arguably the most debated topic at the moment, trade tensions. You mentioned them uh, during your speech today. Uh, in the latest economic outlook, the IMF points out the risk to global growth uh, posed by trade tensions. Protectionism seems to be a wrong reaction to an existing problem of uh, global uh, imbalances. Um, what more reasonable and academically informed uh, solutions would you suggest um, against the current account imbalances? The global imbalances are uh, a problem when they get uh, to be excessive. I mean, not all current account imbalances are necessarily bad, but in the estimation of the IMF, there are uh, excessive surpluses in some countries. You know, Germany would be an example, uh, Korea would be an example, and excessive deficits in others, and there the United States would be an example. Mm -hmm. um, these are primarily macroeconomic phenomenon. Uh, uh, saving uh, minus investment equals the current account. So if you're telling me that protectionism trade policy is going to improve the current account balance, you have to tell me how it will affect saving mm -hmm. and, uh, and investment. And it's not really all that obvious in many, in many cases. Uh, so it is definitely the wrong response to use trade policy and think that you will affect the balance between uh, a country's saving and investment, i.e. It's net, it's net borrowing. That's just not going to work. Um, and so what alternatives would you suggest uh, against uh, especially current account deficits, excessive current account deficits like the American one? Well, one important point is that um, you know, for every excessive deficit, there's likely to be an excessive surplus. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, you put all the burden on one set of countries, uh, they have to do twice as much work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's both unlikely to happen as well as being unfair. So one important point is that countries have to work together uh, on uh, adjusting these excesses. You know, I mentioned that the U.S. has an excessive deficit. Now, the U.S. also last year passed a uh, fiscal uh, tax cut, uh, cutting corporate tax, cutting personal mm -hmm. tax. They also increased government spending. Both of those tend to uh, increase the U.S. current account mm -hmm. deficit. So they're pulling in the, in the wrong direction, uh, which is perhaps ironic given that the goal of trade policy is said to be to reduce the current account deficit. Uh, they could um, move in a direction of more fiscal prudence, which would be a good idea mm -hmm. given the size of the U.S. debt. And countries like Germany could be um, investing more. They could create more private sector incentives mm -hmm. for investment. There's room for productive public infrastructure investment also. But life will be easier if these countries work together on this common problem. Um, exactly. Uh, we need multilateralism. Possibly the, the country that has led uh, so far multilateral initiatives uh, around the world, especially in the 20th century, is in a difficult political context. What role do you see um, the, Europe, the European Union taking in, in championing more uh, economic cooperation and a possible solution to the pressing issues of uh, current account, excessive current account imbalances? Well, it's a, it's a big problem that the United States is uh, withdrawing from its leadership role you know, particularly at a time when there are so many multilateral challenges, um, not just those of a purely economic nature mm -hmm. like uh, global imbalances or trade, but also uh, probably even more important topics like the threat of climate change, mm -hmm. which is becoming more uh, obvious by the day. Uh, you know, the EU has taken a much uh, more um, responsible approach to these issues, I think, in supporting multilateral trade solutions, supporting the Paris Agreement on climate. Mm -hmm. uh, but the U.S., the, the EU itself is facing some internal internal political pressures. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's so far spoken with one voice on many issues, but there are dissenting voices mm -hmm. and uh, there is conflict within the bloc 
remaining on, on this issue. The IMF exactly has been very vocal, um, a very vocal supporter of a gradual leveling of the asymmetries within the bloc, which presently um, represent a threat to the stability of the common uh, monetary area. Uh, the Commission terms um, is coming to an end. Is the Eurozone more solid and homogeneous than it was five years ago? Well, the, 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 the Euro crisis resulted in some very important reforms to the Euro architecture. Um, uh, you know, one thinks of the uh, single supervisory mechanism, the single mm -hmm. resolution mechanism, um, reforms to the um, sort of surveillance of macroeconomic imbalances in the Eurozone. And certainly um, banks are, are somewhat stronger, but, but some of the asymmetries you, you mentioned do remain. And they, they impede the, uh, the possibility, the political possibility of further reforms. For example, uh, in a number of countries, Italy being a notable example, mm -hmm. um, there's still a problem of non-performing loans on banks' balance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, Italy has made progress on those, but those are viewed as a major obstacle in countries like mm -hmm. Germany to moving further towards a more complete banking union uh, uh, system-wide deposit insurance and reforms that are really necessary to uh, to strengthen the system. Uh, we'll come back on on this issue. Um, I would like to focus on a specific case within the eurozone. Uh, European leaders, especially now that we are celebrating the 20th birthday of the euro, um, are trying to sell Greece's recent economic performance as a success story. Uh, while the IMF has been more cautious, uh, pointing out that um, the debt sustainability is based on uh, very op optimistic assumptions on uh, the level of GDP growth in the next few years. Um, <laughs> given the current global conditions, uh, how likely is that Greece will need further debt relief measures uh, to maintain access to our capital markets? Well, the, the IMF assessment um, uh, throughout the um, you know the third Greek program, which mm -hmm. ultimately the IMF did not did not, did not join with financial support, mm -hmm. was that um, Greece would need more um, debt relief, uh, but should also uh, be asked uh, to um, well, should also should also be allowed to have a smaller structural budget surplus going forward on the grounds that. You know, political sustainability, the need to maintain mm -hmm. basic and improve basic social services uh, was very great in Greece. So, um, you know, as a result of these policy differences, the IMF did not actually join the mm -hmm. third program. Uh, the clock ran out on that particular um, program in, in August. Um, I think it will be, it will be challenging uh, for Greece to uh, uh, move forward without further mm -hmm. uh, Further, further debt relief going forward. We'll we'll see uh, how their how their growth performance is. But uh, you know, over the last uh, uh, bit of time, up until fairly recently, Europe was growing quite quickly. That helped Greece. Europe seems to be slowing down rather markedly now. Italy, for example, mm -hmm. is now officially in recession. Mm -hmm. So that's going to going to uh, going to cause a very a very uh, uh, difficult environment, a much more difficult environment for Greece to uh, to move forward. Uh, you know, to the extent that the Greek government also uh, reverses any earlier reforms, that will also make life more difficult in terms of fiscal sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, yeah. If, in fact, global growth slows markedly, um, it'll be a difficult time. Um, you mentioned uh, non-performing loans. Moving on to China, uh, the handling of NPLs has become a top priority in Beijing, as the level of bad debt in Chinese banks' balance sheets um, has reached level unseen for, for decades. Uh, what is the potential impact of a weak banking sector in China on Chinese and global economic outlook? Well, I think the Chinese authorities rightly um, took to heart this problem of, um, of financial excesses there, including in the, um, you know, the non-bank sector. And, um, uh, they've been taking action. Uh, the, the IMF certainly recommended such action. Uh, that has had some effect in slowing the economy. Unfortunately, uh, the economy has also been subject to the external shock of um, 
trade measures from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the uncertainty effects of the threat of mm -hmm. further trade measures. Uh, so uh, we do see some slowdown in China, and that mm -hmm. is a threat not only for the Chinese economy, obviously, mm -hmm. but for all of, uh, all of uh, the neighbors and for, indeed for the whole world. Um, for a number of uh, Asian countries, uh, you know, including China, um, Taiwan, Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, Korea, we've seen uh, much weaker data and particularly weaker trade data, and that's worrisome. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned slowdown in GDP growth in China. Do you see this as a potential driver of a more moderate approach uh, to trade negotiations by China? Well, I think it, it, it hurts their, their bargaining position in the sense that um, you know, they're, they're less able to withstand uh, trade measures by the U.S. And I think we've seen them, um, uh, certainly in terms of their, their, their messaging to the U.S. and their public communication uh, take a conciliatory tone. Um, they've made some offers with respect to uh, um, agricultural imports, for example, mm -hmm. which uh, you know would play very well with the U.S. Uh, part of the problem in that negotiation, though, is that um, it's never been, been totally clear what the U.S. objective is. Different elements within the U.S. government probably have different objectives, some of which would require China to uh, revise its long-term growth strategy and where I think China would push back very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that we have reached an advanced stage of a long moment of economic expansion and international attention now concentrates on the quantity and the quality of the global financial safety nets uh, we have in place. Should we need another immediate provision of liquidity as we did in the past? Uh, what is the current degree of preparedness of the global multi-layered system uh, for emergency liquidity provision? Well, I think there are a couple of worries uh, there. Um, you know, in the, in the uh, uh, aftermath of the global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, and other central banks, but, but I think the most important one was the Federal Reserve, um, made available swap lines to a range of central banks. And while those have been institutionalized for the big six advanced country central banks, it's just unclear how broadly these would be available in a new crisis, given the attitudes of the new, of the new administration. Um, so that's one worry. Um, there's a worry about the IMF's resources and those being adequate to the task. You know, financial markets keep growing and um, the IMF's resources don't grow automatically. <laughs> So uh, that's another area where we would have to worry. Um, I would like to conclude exactly on, on this point. Um, increasingly, academics and political leaders, including uh, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, um, who we hosted uh, earlier this year, are pushing for a larger moment of China within the IMF. Um, should we expect major changes uh, from the next IMF um, general review of quotas? The IMF has... Uh, in my view, acted very wisely by bringing China into the SDR uh, and taking an, an approach which I think would be wise for the U.S. to emulate of basically um, keeping China in the system, keeping them at the table, giving them a stake in multilateral processes and in being a, a good citizen rather than pursuing a confrontational approach. Um, the uh, next quota review um, you know, should certainly adjust voting shares to reflect uh, the, uh, the uh, growth of emerging markets generally, not just, not just China. Uh, but of course, this quota increase, uh, which would go with the, the reallocation, has been opposed by the U.S. I think that's incredibly short-sighted. Um, uh, you know, it, it, with U.S. backing, the IMF just made its largest loan ever to Argentina, mm -hmm. $57 billion. If Venezuela, um, as, as we might hope, has a peaceful transition, transition to a, a more democratic government, they will definitely need an IMF program, and it will be at least as large as Argentina. So I think the need for more resources is manifest to, to most governments, to most of the IMF shareholders. I think it's likely to become more apparent to the United States, hopefully so, because you know, a strong IMF is at the center mm 
of the global financial safety net, and if it's not adequately resourced, uh, the global safety net will be weak. Thank you very much, Professor Oswald, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.